to be back here in Wangaroo today. You probably wondered whether we'd shifted away without shifting our membership, but uh, I think our membership still is here, and we're here, and we've been all over the place, and are doing a bit of a circuit uh, around the north. Last week we were in Kaikoui, and there's a lot of happy people in Kaikoui, and uh, it was a real pleasure to be there, and of course I'm in Dargaville regularly. Uh, as well, and uh, then we were in Kaitaia a um, week or two ago as well, and uh, uh, Kaitaia, uh, pretty cheerful, and they're all, uh, well, both Kaiko and Kaitaia have been pretty successful with their CHIP health programs, and the people are pretty enthusiastic about it all there, so that's, uh, <coughs> that's good, it's uh, good when there's been successes, and people are telling good stories, and uh, you see something for your effort, and uh, that uh, is encouraging. <coughs> well, uh, today I want to uh, <coughs> take your thoughts to uh, initially something that you're very familiar with, uh, I would think, and I've entitled my uh, sermon today, Oh, for a submarine, an aircraft carrier, or something that floats. So let's go to the scripture and go to Exodus chapter 14, Exodus 14, and uh, this is the account of the children of Israel confronted by the Red Sea and to the rear, the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 14. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall you encamp by the sea. <coughs> Don't worry too much about those big names of those places there. Uh, it doesn't matter except to know that this was a place that we might call a cul-de-sac. It was a place that had no way out. And uh, you know that we have these streets that we call cul-de-sacs. Um, usually they're fairly short, but you drive to the end of them and you can't get out. Unless, of course, you turn around and go out the way you came in. This was about how it was. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. You see, the children of Israel had been in Egypt some 400 years, and uh, during that time they had changed to be guests of the Pharaoh to becoming slaves of the Pharaoh. And there's a big difference between being a guest and a slave, isn't there? Which would you rather be, a guest or a slave? And uh, they had become enslaved in Egypt, and God had called them out of Egypt because he wanted the descendants of Abraham to be free people. God never intended that they should be enslaved in Egypt, but God works through the natural uh, occurrences and the ebb and flow of society to a great degree, and uh, he allowed this to happen, and uh, in the long run it, it played into his plan. God is able to turn those negative things into positives eventually. And so uh, the Pharaoh eventually let them go. The children of Israel had seen some remarkable miracles happen. As uh, Moses and Aaron had confronted the Pharaoh and had asked uh, to, for the release of the Israelites so that they could go to the land that was promised to them, so they could worship their God, the God who is the true God? The Egyptians, of course, worshipped multiple gods. And uh, they had seen their gods shamed by these miracles, these plagues that had occurred. And each one of their significant gods had been shamed as the <coughs> plagues struck Egypt. And even the God who was supposed to protect them and protect them for life was shamed when the angel passed over the land in that last plague, and killed the firstborn of man and beast right throughout the country of Egypt. 
but left the Israelite camp alone. The Israelites had been instructed by Moses to place the sign of their true God on their doorpost, the sign of sacrifice. And they took the blood of a slain lamb and they <coughs> painted it on the doorposts and over the lintel of the door and they partook of the carcass of that lamb as a uh, sacrificial lamb. They ate it that night and the angel that passed over the land with the instruction to kill saw the sign of the true God, the sign of sacrifice over their dwellings and not a soul died. The Pharaoh, of course, awoke about midnight, we're told, and uh, he saw the death, he heard the moans and cries of bereavement, and uh, the people said to him, let the Israelites go. If this is what's going to happen to us, there will be no dynasty left in Egypt to rule us. If this is what's going to happen, we will have no families. Our families will be decimated. Our stock and herds will be destroyed. Let them go. So Moses took the Israelites on a prearranged night out of Egypt. He prepared them. They left, I presume, early in the morning. They left Egypt for the land that had been promised to them for so long. They'd come to the point where they were standing before this place, Baal Zephon, a heathen name, by the way, and uh, there they stood with the Red Sea in front of them and uh, a rock to their right which they could not ascend or climb over, a mountain really I would say, a precipice, and uh, <coughs> behind them at this moment the Egyptian army was pursuing. The Pharaoh had changed his mind. What a fool I am, he says to himself, what a fool I am to let that handful of... of uh, <coughs> Israelites influence my thinking so much. We'll go and get these slaves back again. He harnessed his horses to his chariots, took his armies with him and pursued after the Israelites. They would have traveled much, much faster than the Israelites. The Israelites had gone a few days into this uh, wilderness area uh, and with their flocks and their herds and their children, the old people and those who were not well, of course, uh, it would have been a slow process and strung out along the track there into this place that was unknown to them but was known to Moses was uh, the Israelite uh, troop. The Pharaoh thought this would be an easy take. They will prefer slavery to death. I'll round them all up and take them home again. And the Israelites saw the dust of the Egyptian army ascending up above the, the desert conditions there, and fear struck their hearts. They complained to Moses that uh, perhaps he had led them out there as a trick, because after all, Moses was a sort of a prince of Egypt. Maybe Moses had been a deceiver all this time. <coughs> but uh, Moses, in verse 13, said to the people, Fear ye not, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you will hold your peace. Moses, the man of faith. Moses, the man who knew God. Moses was the man who knew that God could do things that we would consider totally impossible. God likes to do things that we find impossible. God delights in doing things that we say we can't do. He knows that we can't do. Placemakers have a little sign. You see it written all over their things and over their trucks, don't you? Um, <coughs> can do. Can do. We like to think that we can do. But there are some things that we cannot do. And there are some things outside of the ordinary realm of physical activity that we cannot do. And one of those major things, in fact the major thing that we cannot do, we cannot save ourselves from the <coughs> attacks 
of the devil. Let me remind you that uh, Egypt in Scripture is used as a symbol for Satan. Egypt is used as a symbol for Satan and his philosophy. Egypt is used as the symbol of Satan and his enslaving intentions. Uh, Egypt is used as a symbol for Satan's enslavement and uh, encumbrance upon us. And Pharaoh claimed that the children of Israel were entangled in the land, they would not be able to escape. And Satan claims that we are trapped and entangled in his snare and we shall not escape. Isaiah said that uh, the devil entraps his people, takes them prisoner and never releases them. Jesus had some similar things to say. Satan's intention is that we should be enslaved in his philosophy of life, in <coughs> being uh, uh, in opposition to God, and he enslaves us in such a way that we are unable to escape. Adam and Eve didn't know what they were doing when they committed themselves to the philosophy of Satan. They didn't know that it would lead to enslavement and that they would not be able to escape the enslavement that they let themselves into when they followed Satan's philosophy of doubting and going in contrary uh, to God. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they discovered the result of disobedience to God, which we call sin, enslaves us. We've probably learned a thing or two down through the ages, and with the written history of the human race as we have it in the Scripture, we should surely understand that sin enslaves humanity. It enslaves angelic beings. And if it enslaves angelic beings, how much more is it going to enslave human beings? For a third of the angels followed Satan. A third of them became enslaved with his philosophy, infatuated with it, fascinated with it, false as it is and unreasonable as it is. They were enslaved by Satan. And a third of the angels had to leave the kingdom of God in heaven because they had become enslaved and they preferred Satan as a boss than God. The Pharaoh said, the children of Israel are entangled. And Satan says, I will entangle every human being in my mesh, in my web. I will entangle them and they will not escape. <clears throat> but Moses, but Moses, a man of faith, a man in whom the Holy Spirit <coughs> was present in a very pronounced way, the man of faith says, stand still, do not fear, the salvation of the Lord will resolve this problem. And so the children of Israel are standing there looking at the Red Sea and the only sensible way of escape is somehow to venture across the Red Sea. Now I don't know just where they crossed the Red Sea. Some people claim that they know exactly where they crossed the Red Sea but they don't take into account some of the facts that the Scripture states. Clearly the Red Sea was very close to Egypt. And every time in Scripture that, you, uh, that we talk about, uh, that we read about the Red Sea, and every description that's given of the Red Sea is always related very close to Egypt. So it was some sort of a boundary in Egypt. And the children of Israel stood there. The only thing that they could possibly do was hope for a submarine, an aircraft carrier or something that floats that will take them across the Red Sea. They'd never heard of aircraft carriers. Uh, carriers. They'd never heard of submarines. And the best that they had known of boats were probably reed boats made with bundles of reeds strapped together that plied up and down the Nile. 
and there were none of them floating around in the Red Sea. So it was a pretty hopeless situation, wasn't it? On the face of it. The Lord will fight for you, Moses said, and you will hold your peace. And so I suppose they thought, well, maybe we will turn against the Egyptians and uh, the few little armaments that we have here, we will somehow be successful in a fight against uh, the Egyptians. And none of them wanted to be engaged in war because slaves are not trained how to fight, are they? You don't train your slaves how to be the very best in military uh, activity because obviously they might turn against you and use their techniques that they've been taught against their masters. And that was the case, of course, in many of the countries that held slaves years ago in America and England and countries that we feel ashamed to talk about in relation to slavery. They didn't train their slaves to do well in the military because, of course, they might turn against their masters. And so they were a pretty feeble lot. <clears throat> Let me read on a, bit, a little bit. Verse 16, God's talking to Moses and he says, Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel will go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, <laughs> behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians they will follow them, and I will get honour upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honour upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Remember that God had made himself manifest in this cloud. It gave them light at night. It gave them shade in the daytime. And as the cloud moved ahead of them, they were able to follow, and that was the route that they were to take. Verse 20 says, And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, that's the Israelites, so that the one came not near the other all the night. <clears throat> Someone still stands as our protector. Someone still stands as the one who is between our enemy and ourselves. And that one is the one who has been called the light of the world, and that is Jesus. Jesus was the one who stood in the cloud and was darkness on one hand and light on the other. Jesus is the one who stands between us and the enemy, Satan. Jesus is the one who protects us. And when Satan claims boldly that we are entangled in such a way that we shall never escape his grasp, Jesus comes in and he is the one who stands between us and the enemy and gives us protection. Moses, the man who was filled with the Holy Spirit, and remember that the Holy Spirit does fill human beings. We often think or picture the Holy Spirit as someone who comes and stands beside us. But the Holy Spirit is not one who comes and stands beside us. The Holy Spirit is one who comes into us. And human beings do things and uh, <coughs> are uh, able to accomplish things through themselves in apparently normal activity when the Holy Spirit is within them. And Christians are able to do things that they would not otherwise be able to do when the Holy Spirit is in them. Jesus was only able to do what he did because the Holy Spirit was in him. And when Jesus was baptized and started on his ministry, he was able to do what he did, perform miracles, heal the sick, cast out demons, do all those things because the Holy Spirit was in him. The Holy Spirit was not someone who walked beside him and the Holy Spirit did the activity the human being did the activity. Jesus, as a human being, performed the activity. 
And Moses, as a human being, performed these miracles because the Holy Spirit was in him, because he was a person of faith. Because he had absolute trust in God, God could trust to put the Holy Spirit into Moses. And Moses <coughs> stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord still fights for us against the enemy today. The Lord is the one, the Lord here is Jesus. The Lord mentioned here is Jesus. Jesus still fights against the enemy today if we will invite him to do so. If we will trust him, if we will trust him, the Holy Spirit will come into our lives and we will be able to do things that we were never able to do before. And I'm not just talking about doing spectacular things. I'm not just talking about healing the sick or casting out demons. I'm talking about those things where the devil entangles us more than anything else. That is, those little sins. Those little sins of doubt. Those little sins of a lack of confidence in the power of God in our lives. And those other sins, those practical kind of sins, those bad habits that we have, they're just as important to get rid of as those other things of doubt. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives because the Lord is there, because the Lord authorizes it, we are able to cast aside the entanglements and the chains of the devil and we are able to be freed. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, verse 26, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen, and Moses stretched forth his hand again. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. His simple action, very human, stretching out his hand with his rod in it, no doubt, over the water. <coughs> and the waters came again, <coughs> returned in their strength. When the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The water returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all Pharaoh's host that came into the sea after the Israelites, there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the shore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord had uh, did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The Egyptians were destroyed. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, the first four verses there, the Apostle Paul uses this experience, as does all Bible, almost all Bible writers, when they refer to the occasion of crossing the Red Sea, they refer to it as the most significant activity that took place in the exodus from Egypt to the Promised Land. Why do they consider it so significant? All through the history of the Jews, they referred back time and again to this experience of crossing the Red Sea. And even today, it is a very significant topic in Jewish conversation. And, uh, of course, the Jewish people still practice the Passover. 
And the Passover, of course, led to this experience, directly to the experience of crossing the Red Sea. Why was it so significant? Let me tell you. It is so significant because at the moment they stepped in and walked across on dry land through the middle of the Red Sea, those people changed from being slaves to being free men. They changed their status from being slaves to being free. I imagine some of them probably thought it would be better to stay on the other side. It would be better to stay where they'd ended up beside the Red Sea rather than to step out into the Red Sea and cross over. But they went across anyway. The Israelites were one moment slaves, entangled and entrapped by the symbol of Satan himself. And the next moment, they're free. What does that do for the human heart? What does that do for a normal human being? Do you like being enslaved? How do you feel when you can't see your way out of an impasse? At this present time in the recession that we are suffering, that the whole world is suffering, a financial recession, there are people who can't see their way out. There are people whose mortgages that gave them excitement at one time because it gave them a lovely house or a lovely business building or gave them nice things and gave them comfort and maybe gave them an elevation in, in their status in society, is now an entanglement. It's now a noose around their neck, as we say. It's now a chain around their ankle. And what would they give to be free? They're slaves. They're slaves to the banking system. They're slaves to commerce. They're slaves to what society has put in place, and they would give a lot to be free. But worse than that, there are people who have become enslaved with the traps of Satan, with the very symbols of Satanism. They're enslaved with tobacco, they're enslaved with drugs, they're enslaved with alcohol, they're enslaved with pornography, they're enslaved with sex. They're enslaved with greed. They're enslaved with hatred. They're enslaved with jealousy. They're enslaved with envy. They're enslaved with covetousness. You think of all the other things that they are enslaved in and can be enslaved in. And maybe you're even thinking in your own heart that I, at this moment, am a slave. I'm not a free person. I'm a slave. There were so many things that the devil entangles his followers in and enslaves them. And they're standing beside the Red Sea of life. And they need a submarine or they need a battleship or they need an aircraft carrier or they need a reed boat or something to take them across the Red Sea of life and free them from the enslavement that they are in. The children of Israel were free. When they stepped out and followed the pathway that the Lord had made through his servant Moses, they were free. They were free. No longer were they slaves, no longer were they servants to the Egyptians. And that 400 <coughs> years of Egyptian bondage was dropped off, just like that, just in a moment, because the Lord Jesus Christ had opened a pathway of freedom for them. Do you want obstacles to disappear in your life? but don't know how. 
then I suggest that you look for the pathway that Jesus has prepared. Do you want to be free from the entanglements that you have got yourself into, maybe even willingly, and now you want to get rid of? There's only one way, and that's to step out into the pathway <coughs> that Jesus has made. He tells us in the scripture that if we accept him into our lives, we can be free. Some people are too timid to step out. And you know, for those who defer obedience, those who defer to step out in faith, those who hold off and hold off until every shadow of uncertainty disappears, as Ellen White says. Those who hold off until every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all and will forever be slaves. That's sad, isn't it? Why be a slave? when you can be free. Two great results of the Red Sea experience affected Israel forever. One was they came to know the power of God and his workings through his chosen servants. They came to know the power of God, the true God, and the way he works through his chosen servants. We need to acknowledge and to know the power of God. We need to have confidence that God works through his chosen servants. And when the Holy Spirit is in his chosen servants, tremendous things can happen. The other is that they know, knew that it was God who made them free. They knew that it was God who freed them from the Egyptians. There was no other way because no battleship appeared and no submarine appeared and no aircraft carrier appeared and no little aluminium tinny boat appeared to take them across the Red Sea. They knew that God, in the power of Jesus Christ through his servant Moses, had opened the way through the Red Sea and they were free. I want to end the sermon by just referring you to the next chapter, chapter 15 of Exodus, because it is a chapter of rejoicing. And when they got across onto the other side and all the people had got there and had settled their animals and so on, they had a time of rejoicing. And, uh, and they sang and they danced and Moses composed a song and Miriam led the women as they sang and danced and Moses seemed to lead the men as they sang and danced and uh, they danced with excitement and with joy and rejoicing because they had come from slavery to freedom. And if you feel as though today you've come from slavery to freedom, and if today you've accepted Jesus Christ and his power into your life and his Holy Spirit into his life, if you've decided today that you will get rid of the entanglement of Satan in your life, then if you want to dance down the aisle today, I won't object. Somebody will scowl at you, but I won't. I might even come and dance with you. I don't know how to dance. I haven't a clue how to dance. But if freedom from slavery drives you to dance down the aisle today, I won't object, will you? I know some of you won't object. Some of you will probably join with you. I'm not asking you to do it. <coughs> I'm just saying if you do do it, why not express our gratitude to God because of his freedom. I know it was culturally uh, a thing that they did in those days. In many parts of the world, people still dance <laughs> when they're excited. They still dance when something good happens. They dance when there's something to, some praise to be given, and so on. I know it's very much a cultural thing, and I'm not saying that dancing down the aisle just for the sake of dancing around is a good thing, but let's be happy today that Jesus has opened a way through the Red Sea. The big barrier that Satan puts up there and says, you can't do it, you haven't got confidence to do it, you can't be a Christian, you can't get rid of the sins in your life, I've got you tangled, I've got a stranglehold on you, I've got a chain around your ankles, you can't do it. 
If you've decided that Jesus can do it for you today, you're free. You're free. <laughs> Romans 6 and verse 17 tells us that uh, the Romans were once servants of sin, but now they're servants of Christ and they're free. John 8 verse 34 to 36, Jesus is answering some questions that the Pharisees put uh, to him. And Jesus knew that the Pharisees were entangled in the devil's trap and uh, that they didn't know a way out of it. But Jesus says, if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. If Jesus makes you free, you are free indeed. Let's accept it. Romans 6, 23, 23. Christ frees us from the bondage of sin in two ways, both technically and, phys and in reality. <coughs> we are freed from the bondage of sin so Paul tells the Romans. Galatians 5 and verse 1, we are to enjoy the liberty that Christ has obtained for us. We are to enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the liberty that Christ has obtained for us. Jesus died on a cross to set you and I free. Jesus died on the cross and destroyed the claim of Satan that we could never please God. And he set us free. So today, if you're thinking the Red Sea is in front of you and the great mountain, the great rock precipice is beside you and the Egyptians are behind you and you're not free, then accept Jesus into your life today and know what freedom is. Jesus can open the pathway so you can resolve all the problems that you think stop you from being a Christian. And those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat, will never obey at all and will never know freedom. Don't wait until everything's clear. Don't wait until the pathway's open. You see, Moses said to the people, get up and start walking to the Red Sea. I trust today that we will have confidence. I trust you'll have confidence in the pathway that Jesus has opened, the pathway that is sprinkled with his blood, the pathway that leads to the cross, the pathway that leads us to the place where Satan is defeated, where that great <laughs> symbol, Egypt, Satan is defeated, and you're free. I'll leave you with a question today. Are you free? If you're not, then do something about it. If you don't want to be, enjoy the best you can being entangled in Satan's trap. Because I remember once when we used to put a fishing net across the creek at home, across the river. And I remember my little sister, she was little then, she was about four or five years old, and uh, I pulled up the net, because I was seven years old, and I pulled up the, the net uh, which used to run across the piles of the bridge. I pulled up the net, and there was a fish in it, um, a, um, a trevally, and uh, it was, was flapping and whatever, and Helen said, that fish looks to be really happy in the fishing net. <laughs> if you're happy in your net, you stay there. But I can tell you, you won't always be happy, because you know what happened to the trevally? It was on the dinner table that night. It wasn't happy anymore. You can be free. Why not be free? Let's sing together our closing hymn. It's number 340 if you're using uh, the music. Uh, Jesus saves. <clears throat> and we'll invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn.